many men is part of this cycle of life, forming a passive part. You see, the great prophecies of the Bible bring present-day events into focus. Hello and welcome to South Pacific Classics. I'm Alan Lindsay. In this series, we dust off some of the hidden gems in our film archives in the name of history, inspiration and enjoyment. Health has been emphasised by the Seventh-day Adventist Church since its beginnings. It was this focus that led to the invention of the humble cornflake in the late 1800s. The Church continues to promote health at the level of the local congregation as well as the corporate level running hospitals, clinics and health farms, and manufacturing health foods. Our first film for this show depicts Adventist medical missionaries in Papua New Guinea about a decade before independence in 1975. The language used in this film to describe the people and customs of PNG does not meet today's standards of political correctness, but it is clear that both the white missionaries and their local colleagues were fiercely committed to the health and spiritual well-being of their patients. As a warning, the film you're about to see contains graphic images of various medical conditions and some nudity in a traditional village setting. I hope you'll enjoy and be inspired by Light in the Jungle. Since the island of the South Pacific were first discovered, they have attracted to their palm-fringed shores a host of explorers, trade adventurers. In earlier days, they were the hideout of notorious pirates and mutineers, and the haunt of beachcombers, bent on the codes and restrictions of civilization. Towns and cities have sprung up on these romantic shores. This is Suva, capital of Fiji, a mixture of the old and the new. Fast sea and air lanes have brought tourists and businessmen from the outside world. But the economy of many of these islands is based on the coconut, for copra finds ready buyers on world markets. This, with other tropical products, has brought a measure of wealth to the island people. A new era is dawning in the South Pacific. Because of its size and its rugged terrain, the taming of New Guinea, however, continues to be a major task for government officer, educator, and missionary alike. Ley, one of New Guinea's coastal towns, is a fine example of post-war reconstruction and progress. From here, intrepid pilots in mountain-hopping planes fly patrol officers, social workers, Doctors and nurses high above the flooding rivers, the jungle trails and the hidden villages. Carrying to the hinterland educational facilities and much needed medical aid. Many government stations and mission outposts are built on the fringe of the wilderness. And beyond these frontiers are forbidding mountain ranges, the stronghold of primitive, untouched tribes. In these high regions, the rainforest drips with eternal moisture, and cold grey mists sweep across the ridges. Fear of enemies alone has driven these mountain dwellers to choose such inhospitable village sites. Most tribes, however, have settled in the milder valleys where their food crops flourish. Over the centuries, bypassed by the march of time, these native people have retained a unique Stone Age culture. Even after steel has been introduced, the ancient stone axe continues to be of ceremonial significance and of special value when purchasing pigs or maybe a wife. Strong in the minds of the people are superstitions regarding evil spirits and their supposed control of human welfare. This mountain tribe uses a stone mortar and pestle to symbolize certain facets of life. His face blackened with charcoal, the devil priest blows softly on bamboo pipes.
to pacify the spirits believed to live in the stones. Larger bamboo pipes are also used, creating weird and monotonous music in an endeavor to contact the tribal spirits. So the people's lives are ruled by dark fears and strange customs. At the time of the village Sing Sing or ceremonial dance, the people gather in special jungle clearings to take part in the celebrations. The fabulous plumes of the bird of paradise are used in the creation of gaudy headdresses. Dusky skins are decorated with crude pigments, rancid grease and pearl shell ornaments as participants prepare for this annual ritual. The stamping of bare feet and the chanting of weird war cries set the rhythm for this wild display as dancers, sweating under the tropic sun, parade around the dust-filled grove. The energies of these people are put to more practical use in the building of roads and airstrips. In these mountain places, mechanical earth moving equipment is not always available. It may take a little longer to build an airstrip this way, but at least it gives these happy-go-lucky tribesmen the feeling of having had a part in improving their country's transport facilities. The New Guinea administration's road building program extends throughout the highlands with a long range plan for a complete network. But the distances are so great and the country so rugged that exploration and pioneering must of necessity be done on foot. The missionary on patrol forges his way into the deepest jungles and over the roughest terrain to answer the cry of suffering humanity. These mercy trips often entail weeks of hard climbing, crossing flooded rivers, toiling through swamps and leech-infested rainforests. Well-equipped hospitals have been established in many areas. Supplementary to these are medical aid posts and field clinics set up in remote jungle places, bringing help to a people who cannot travel far from their tribal lands. In these situations, the medical missionary and his native trainees do a real job in controlling malaria, dysentery, yaws, ulcers, leprosy and other tropical diseases. Patrols into these areas work wonders in raising health standards and natives are not without gratitude. Here, an aged villager who seemingly had little hope of survival walks in a few days after treatment to present missionary Len Barnard with an armful of corn in grateful appreciation. A heartwarming experience for any missionary. At Rockamunda Mission Station, Mrs. Pascoe, a trained nurse, attends to the daily medical lineup while her husband is out on patrol. Anything from burns and wounds to eye infections are treated here. Or maybe it's a troublesome tooth. Mothers of every land love their children, and these are no exception. They will travel long distances on foot to receive medical aid and mothercraft instruction. The public health department and medical missionary organizations are coordinated in bringing to the New Guinea people a progressive program of health and hygiene. Medical training for young natives, both male and female, is an important feature of this plan. The Seventh-day Adventist Medical Training Center at Omara in the Eastern Highlands has fitted many New Guineans for service among their own people. In their primitive state, these natives have virtually no knowledge of personal hygiene or village sanitation.
These keen young graduates will man medical aid posts and clinics, carrying the battle against tropical disease to the remotest tribal frontiers. The doctor boys, as they are affectionately called, do a humanitarian work among lepers, assisting in the treatment of hundreds of patients on the Hansonide colonies. Leprosy, now known as Hansen's disease, is a scourge that dates back to prehistoric times. Modern medicine, in a course of prolonged treatment, can arrest this tissue-destroying disease and give its pitiable victims a new hope in life. The hopelessness of a stricken leper is exchanged for a happiness of spirit as the patient feels the benefit of treatment. <laughs> As the winds of change sweep from village to village, the missionary works hand in hand with government departments in a vast uplift program. It is recognized that the native must be given a sense of spiritual values to fill the vacuum created by the relinquishing of ancient and primitive practices. The spirit of progress and self-help is demonstrated in various ways. It is seen here in the teamwork of villagers as they bring in hand-sawn planks for the floor of a new schoolhouse. And in the concerted effort of schoolboys as they weave bamboo walls for their new building. <laughs> Here, a native teacher crosses enemy boundaries to give gospel lessons to the people in their own language by means of a small hand-operated gramophone, proving that love can overcome fear, suspicion, and hate. This thought is further demonstrated by Dr. Roy Yates as he examines new arrivals at his mission clinic. Compassion for their less fortunate fellow man is shown by these faithful doctor boys as they help a Hanson-eyed cripple to his morning shower. The scourge of tropical disease. The curse of ignorance and superstition. The uselessness of fear and distrust the hopelessness of hedonism, the pathos in the face of a young leper, the opportunities for giving underprivileged children a better chance in life, to raise native women from degradation to the dignity of enlightened motherhood. These are the things that call selfless men and women to serve humanity in distant fields, bringing light to the darkest jungles of human thought. Should we who stay at home be less generous in our support of these projects? A Hebrew lawyer once asked the teacher of Galilee, who is my neighbor? A question as poignant today as it was in biblical times. While there remains a sick body, a hungry mouth, a broken heart, or an untrained mind, there remains a challenge to privileged society. For surely, every man is our neighbor. Eric Weir, the producer of that film, would have been a very busy man during the 60s and 70s, judging by his prolific output from all over the Asia-Pacific region during that period. He returned a number of times to film the work of Len Barnard, one of the missionaries featured in The Light in the Jungle. It seems the two men struck up quite a friendship, 
and in 1968, Weir wrote a book about his experiences with Len Barnard entitled Perilous Paradise, now out of print. We'll be back with more South Pacific classics right after the break. Welcome back to South Pacific Classics. Much of the archival material we've seen on this show was shot in the Pacific Islands. But while Adventist missionaries were active overseas, the church in Australia was very much aware of the mission field at their front door. This next film was released in 1970. It was intended for use with members of the public attending community workshops provided by the church, stop smoking seminars, nutrition classes, and cooking demonstrations. You'll notice that in this film there are quick cuts, angle shots, zooms and focus pulls that reinforce the message about fast-paced city life. But these techniques also communicate something about the filmmakers. We are young, we are edgy, we are not afraid to take risks. This is Wastelines and Lifelines. to find time to keep fit and slim these days. But some people are keen enough to make time. Things are different on the land. Work is never quite done. There's always hard work, active work that keeps you strong and trim. City life can be a complex one, for many, an unhealthy one. Skipped meals, lack of exercise, too much tension, too much weight producing food. So many devices have been invented to save us physical effort. and muscle is replaced by fat from the extra food we eat. We have even invented machines to think for us. A large percentage of the population is overweight. People in every age group. Nobody really enjoys being fat, with your friends joking about you, and your boss considering a replacement who is less of a health risk. Then there's the increased danger of heart disease and diabetes, and problems affecting other systems of the body. Take Ron, for instance. 35 years of age, a junior executive of the city company. 
Ron wants to advance with the business, but he has a serious problem. He is grossly overweight. Statistically, the mortality rate for men with a weight problem such as yours is, as you will appreciate, 50% higher than for a man of average weight, say, of your own age. We would require you to have a complete medical checkup with our doctor, but I feel that your weight will almost certainly influence his decision. Will that mean that you won't be able to insure me then? Well, I think it means that we could offer you a limited acceptance involving a very short-term policy, or a full acceptance, which unfortunately means a higher premium. Well, how did it go today? Well, because of my weight, I can't even get life assurance. Well, why don't you try a reducing clinic? They say they can just melt the fat off with sauna bars, belts and weights. Well, it might be an idea at that. Don't you think it's about time you tried something like dieting, Ron? Look at this. A lettuce diet here, and it claims to take off a stone in less than a fortnight. Why don't you give that a go? I'm ready to try anything. Ron is ready to try anything. Anything but professional advice. That sauna may relax his muscles but it doesn't remove fat, only body fluid, which is replaced by the next drink. <laughs> Poor Ron. No one could last long on that type of program. It was only indigestion this time. You're a lucky man. But I am worried about your heart. If you don't do something about your weight, you'll greatly increase your risk of coronary heart disease. Just a few pounds can be serious. I'd like you to come and see me tomorrow before you leave, and I'll get you onto a correct program of weight control. If you don't use the calories you eat, your body stores them as fat. I'll give you a progressive exercise program beginning with walking. You'll have to begin slowly because you haven't been active either at leisure or at work. If you follow the exercise program consistently, however, it'll help burn up some excess fat and the exercise itself will be of great value in the conditioning of your heart and your whole system. But I do want to stress that exercise itself is of limited value in actual weight reduction and in maintaining a satisfactory weight without dietary control. In your case, as in the case of most overweight people, dietary factors are of the greatest importance. We must get to grips with your food problem. I want you to take this diet order to the dietitian. She'll go into the question of your food intake in detail and will make recommendations which will become an important part of the total management of your health problem. The doctors asked me to explain this to you. Now, you didn't gain this weight in the last six months, so you shouldn't expect to lose it in a month. Rapid weight loss on a crash diet like you've just tried is never permanent, and it can even be dangerous. 
It's important to have a balanced, tasty diet you can follow to maintain that weight loss for the rest of your life. Now here is your basic daily meal plan. Breakfast, one piece of fruit, one serving of bread or cereal, one savoury and skim milk. It's important to begin the day with a good breakfast which is often skipped by busy people and those trying to slim. Lunch, whether at work or home, should be appetizing and nutritious. A sandwich, salad or protein filled, along with a piece of fruit, makes a balanced meal. The evening meal, contrary to popular practice, should be a light one. And remember, it's most important that you don't eat between meals. How are you feeling, Ron? Really good, thanks. I feel much better than I did. And I feel I can do more. I believe you lost a lot of weight. I've lost a terrific lot of weight. Look at my waist, I hardly believe it. Like Ron, you can have lasting success when your slimming is based on this plan of balanced exercise and correct diet. How's your waistline? If you have a weight problem, why not take positive steps to reduce? Now. The message of that film still resonates as the so-called lifestyle diseases continue to take their toll on the population of Western countries. We hope you've enjoyed being with us. Don't forget to tune in next time to South Pacific Classics. I'm Alan Lindsay. See you then.